So far, what we've been doing so far, we have been looking at um, you know, probabilistic information, decision makings, and all of that. Today, we want to look at uh, the methods for assessing decisions or methods for deciding on things to do. For example, should you do the MBA or you should just marry and give birth to children? Should you go and do your master's abroad or should you do it you know, inside your own country? Should you marry or not marry? Should you remain single or you don't remain single? You know, should you do your PhD or you should not do your PhD? Should you take the job or you shouldn't take the job? The amount of money you're going to use for your master's degree is the same amount you're going to use to start a business. Which one should you go for? Decisions. Decisions. It's all about decisions. How you make those decisions are necessary. And that's what we want to look at today. We want to look at how decisions affect you. Mathematically speaking, decisions affect us. So we want to look at decision analysis. It's a technique, a methodology for identifying and modeling the behavior of, of, of things that come around us. And it requires that you use some underlining tools to be able to make those decisions. So there are two kinds of decision making. One is deciding with uncertainty. The other is deciding without uncertainty or with certainty. You see, decision making with certainty is the one we've looked at. Everything under linear programming, non-linear programming, um, goal programming, AHP, and several others, integer, all of them, they are decision making with certainty. You know, you have the, the items. You know that how many fan eyes, fan you go, and all of that that you're going to produce, you are certain of the items. But there are some decisions you take where you are not certain. Okay, and those ones are probabilistic. And those are the ones that we want to look at because life is full of uncertainties. So there are three things you want to note if you are undertaking anything related to decision making. The first one is that you need to understand the decision maker. Okay, the first thing. You need to know who the decision maker is. The decision maker is the one deciding, okay? The second is something we call, and I want to make, I want to put it in a kind of a table for you to appreciate it well. Okay, so let me let me just clear this and put this in the table so that you can appreciate it even more. So, look at this. You have decision alternatives. Okay, decision alternative one, decision alternative two. Decision alternative three, decision alternative four, and on and on. Okay, those are the things you want to decide on. So D1 can be going to do your master's degree. D2 can be getting married and giving birth. D3 can be starting a business. D4 can be, you know, accepting a job offer. So all of these are decision alternatives. And you got to know. So the decision alternative are the items that you got to decide on. But these decision alternatives, each one of them can happen under different state of nature. So the next thing you want to identify is a state of nature. You can have multiple state of nature. State of nature one, state of nature two, state of nature three, state of nature four, state of nature five. It can be as many as possible. The state of nature are the conditions under which you decide on. Okay? The, the, the future events, the environmental global factors that are not under your control, they may or may not be assigned probabilities. Okay? So when you are deciding whether to go for a master's degree, whether you want to go for a PhD, you want to go for a business, you want to go for a job, you want to, if you, these things are under your control. If you want to marry or not, it's under your control. If you want to take up the job and not take up the, it's within your control. If you want to study your master's degree, it's within your control. 
that the state of nature, the state of nature is not in your control. What are some of the states of nature? It can be the inflation. Inflation is not in your control. It is outside your jurisdiction. Okay. The state of nature can be uh, interest rate change, inflationary change, economic damage. For example, if you look at the Ukraine and the Russian war, whatever somebody had decided, let's say you want to start a master's degree in one of the universities in Ukraine, you wouldn't have known that that university is going to be bombed. And so that is outside of your control. You wouldn't have control over that. And that can change whatever decision alternative that you have, whether it is D1 or D2 or D3, they will be affected some way, somehow, by virtue of what you do. And finally, the last thing is what is known as the payoff. The payoff. So the payoffs are the returns, the benefit or the loss. Okay, the returns after you've made the decision. Okay, so given the state of nature and you take a particular decision, what is going to be the outcome, the result, the result of that decision? That is known as the payoff. Okay, that is so the payoffs have to do with the net benefit. It can be profit, it can be revenue, it can be loss, it can be you know gains, everything. That is the situation for the. So your job now is to decide under different state of nature, which is S1, S2, S3, and then each one giving you different payoffs, okay? Each one will also be giving you different, different payoffs there. The question now is what decision should you go for? What D should you go for? Should you go for D1? or you should go for D2, given the state of nature and the pay of that, ladies and gentlemen, is a focus of what we are about to do. At this stage, I wanna believe that you all get a picture. If you have a question, just raise your hand and let me address that before we go into the nitty gritty. Any questions so far? Please use your names. Those of you who have joined with different letters, okay, use your actual names so that I can keep you in the, in the link here. All right, so the best way I'm gonna explain, and I'm gonna show you the method of deciding, the methods you gotta to use to make the decisions. I'm gonna show you the method. Then anytime you're making any decision, you will know what methodology you're gonna to use to make those decisions, okay? So let's start by looking at a storyline, because that's gonna help us to be able to get to the picture here. If you look at, if you look at uh, the screen, we are gonna look at three main ways of making a decision. One is known as the Maximax approach. The Maximax approach, it is said to be the optimistic approach. We have the Maximin approach, which is a pessimistic approach. And then we have the Minimax regret approach, which is the opportunistic approach. These are the ones we're gonna be using to make the decision making wait, wait without probabilities, okay? These are without probabilities. And when I say without probabilities, what I mean is that you don't even consider the, the probability of the state of nature happening. That's not part of it, okay? You see, you, you can say that it, there's going to be high inflation, but you will not know the exact value of the inf inflation, that is it. There is no particular probability that that particular inflation number is going to happen. You don't know. And so that's the one we want to start with, without assigning probability. Let's take a storyline. Kofi Oyo wants to invest in some apartment, office, and the warehouse. The state of nature, that is the conditions that will determine how much profit he's going to make. The state of nature are either good economic conditions or poor economic conditions. So in this case, the S are how many? The S's, S for silicon, they are how many? You can type in there. Okay. So you got the state of nature are good or poor economic conditions. And the D's, the D's are the T 
type of investment alternatives. So how many are the state of nature and how many are the decision alternatives? How many? Uh, Christopher, you said two. Two for the state of nature or for the decision alternative. How many decision alternatives do we have here? How many Ds do we have here? And how many S's do we have here? Type it up for me. How many Ds and how many S's? The S's are what and the Ds are what? What are the S's? What are the Ds? What are the S's? What are the Ds? What are the S's? What are the Ds? Okay. So the S's are two and the Ds are three. All right. So let me show you something. So you have this situation. You have apartment building, okay? Under good economic conditions, apartment building is gonna yield $50,000. But if it is, the economic conditions are poor, the person will make just $30,000. Under good economic conditions, if you should invest in office building, you're gonna have $100,000. But if the economic conditions are poor, you will have negative $40,000. If the economic conditions are good, and the warehouse, you will rake three thirty thousand dollars, and if then they are bad, you rake ten thousand dollars. So that's that's the situation that you have currently in your in your cup. The question is, which one are you going to choose? Well, depending on the level of criteria that you are using, the type of criteria you are using you may decide differently. So we're going to decide based on the first criteria, and that criteria is known as the maximax approach. So let me, let's go to the next page, okay? Maximax, maximax, maximax. My interest is the last word. So you focus on the last word before you focus on the first word. Max at the end is key. It's the max before the maxi. It's a max before the maximum, okay? So let's deal with the maximus. A person who is adopting this maximus approach is a person who is very optimistic of the future. Such a person doesn't believe that the future economic conditions are going to be bad at all. They are always positive about the future. Even during COVID-19, during you know, Russian, Ukraine war, unemployment, that person is positive. They believe the situations are going to be fantastic and they'll be going with those situations. Now, so for such people, they go for something we call the best of the best. The best of the best. Now, what do we mean? What they do is this. They look at, first of all, the best condition. So that is an SSS column. They look at the best condition in there. And then out of that, after they've selected the best out of the conditions in their columns, they now go and select the best of the decision alternative. So such people go for the best S, and then after that, they go for the best D. See how they go. That is it. So now, on the basis of that, using the maximus approach, let's go back to the table. The person using the maximus approach, which decision alternative is he going to select eventually? Who can raise your hand and tell me? Or who can type the answer there for me? Which decision alternative is that person going to go for? Remember, they go for the best state of nature and the best decision. Which one will they go for? Which of the decision alternative is such a person going to select and use? Anybody? Which decision alternative is a person going to select? Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Talk to me. Okay, Francis. Francis, you have an idea you want to share with the class? Okay, let's do that. Um, yeah, Francis, which decision do you think the person is going to go for? Um, okay, Francis, unmute yourself. 
A hello, dog. Yeah, go ahead. Dog, I think the person will go in for uh, the apartment buildings. Why? Why? The yes, um, because the state of nature is good and uh, also comparing the amount involved, I think is. Uh, well, office building. Sorry, Doc. I think I didn't see that. Office building. You yeah, didn't see, right? <laughs> yes. That's why I'm quietly listening to you. <laughs> How you are justifying it. All right. So the person will go for the office building because under the economic conditions, the good one is what the person will go for. So between 30 and 50, he'll go for the 50. Between negative 40, and 100,000, he will go for the 100. Between 10,000 and 30,000, he go for the 30,000. So we are in the good economic condition. Then out of that, he will select which decision to go for. And such a person will go for the office building. So the way you conclude is that under the maximus approach, the recommended decision, the recommended decision is office building, which is D2, yeah. office building, which is D2. Now I'm starting with the easier one, so you want to follow me. Let's go to the next one. The next one is the decision criteria to use is known as the maximum, maximum, maximum. And again, like I always say, you, you focus on the ending word first before you focus on the beginning word. Maximum, min means minimum. So these are the people who don't go for the best of the best. The, we call it the pessimistic criterion. Pessimistic, they are not optimists. They are pessimists. These are people who are always saying that things are not going to be well. Okay, they, are the, they are the sort of people who are, are, are not positive, they are negative about things. So what they do is that they will first of all go for the worst condition before they select the best out of the worst condition. So such people don't go for the best of the worst, best of the best, but they go for the best of the worst. The best of the worst. That's what they go for. So in sort of good and bad economic condition, they will go for the bad condition. At least they want to keep it safe. And then from that, they will select the best of that. So let's go back to the storyline. Tell me for the pessimist, what decision alternative would they choose? The pessimist. What decision alternative would the pessimist choose? Yes, anybody? What decision alternative would a pessimist choose? Okay. So the pessimist is going to first of all look for the bad conditions, which is poor. So between 50 and 30, you go for 30. 100 and negative 40, you go for 100, uh, negative 40. And then 30 and 10,000, you go for the 10,000. He's keeping it safe. Now, out of all these ones, you will now select the best out of this list, and that is 30,000. So for such a person, you will choose apartment building as the best criterion decision. Okay. The next one, the next approach was quickly moved. Since you seem to be fine, you're all great, you're all getting the picture. So the next one is known as the Minimax Regret approach. The Minimax Regret. Minimax regret. Now the word regret here means that there's some regret somewhere. But let's see. Do you remember when we went for the up the, the office building? Okay, hundred thousand went for the office building. Now suppose that the person chose the office building. Let me show you something. Okay. Suppose you chose the office building because of the 100,000, because you believe that economic condition is going to be great. 
And then you realized after that, that economic conditions wasn't great after all. Economic conditions was rather bad. You will regret. You will regret. I'm not gonna ask you what were the person. You will feel regret for not selecting which one because now that economic conditions are bad, because now you are aware, you will feel regret for not selecting which one. Instead of going for the office building and getting the 100,000, you will now regret for not selecting which one. You can tell me. Type it there. Okay, D1 or D2 or the D2. So if you are selected D2 and you have gone into the situation and the economic conditions are bad, yes, you will regret not taking the apartment building. Because now that economic conditions are bad, the apartment building will give you $30,000. But the office building will give you negative $40,000. So you will feel regret. But how much is that regret? The regret is what you have or what you would have had okay, and what you would have had. And so the regret you're going to have is 100,000 minus the 30,000. That is the quantum of regret that you are going to have. Okay. But you see, the minimum regret approach is someone who is an opportunistic. These are the people who will invest in the stock market. They'll wait and see how the bubble is going to burst before they actually invest in the stock market. They don't want to lose. They are very opportunistic. Whatever it is good, they like it. So what would that person do? Well, that person would try to minimize his regret as many times as possible. He doesn't want to regret so much, so we keep cutting down his regret. And so what we are going to do is that to use the minimal regret approach, you need to create something known as a regret table. And so we're going to create a regret table for each decision or thing. Let's start. So first make your table like that. Okay. You have your D1, you have your D2, you have your D3, you have your S1 and then S2. That is how this thing is. And what you have in the table are the, what is not the payoffs, call them the values, okay? The spectral values or the values. So these are the values, 50,000, 30,000, 100,000, negative 40,000, 30,000, 10,000 dollars. Now, we are going to calculate your regret for each one of them. How do you calculate the regret? Well, it's a very simple approach once again. Okay. All you do when you're calculating the regret is this. You will now count something. Regret is given by regret of a particular Number is given by the highest J star minus V I J. So it is B J star or J X minus V I J. So what is that V J? The V J star deals with the highest number in that column. See, the, the, the J is a column. So if you look at that column, like S1 column, what is the highest value there? That is the VJ. And so you have to find the highest value for each column. And so what it means is that the S1, which is the first column, the VJ value is going to be what? Check the table, the table that you had before. You can remember the table, the VJ value, what will it be? Type it there for me. What will be the VJ value, the highest value in that column, in column one? So we are looking at V1, V1. What will be the value for V1? Raise your hand for me or type your answer there. What will be the value for V1? Hmm. Hmm. IV, you said 100,000, and that is correct, okay? So the V1 is 100,000. So what you are going to do now is that you're going to identify that VJ. So VJ, or in this case, V1 is 100,000. What about V2? 
if you check carefully, V2 was 30,000. V2 was 30,000. Okay, so how do you calculate your regret table? This is how you calculate the regret. Take the VJ, that is the highest value, minus that particular number, that particular you know, value payoff. So we're looking for the number here. How do we get the regrets for that one? Well, the highest value is 100 in that first column. So it's going to be 100 minus the D1, the decision alternative that was there. What was the decision alternative? Well, if you go and check, you know that it's 50,000. So when you check it here, you'll notice that it is 50,000. So we are talking about 100,000 minus 50,000. And so, I'm, and I'm gonna keep them in number one. I just wanna clear away the thousands. And so the, the, the regrets for actually going for the 50 will be 50,000. How much will you regret if you should go for the 100,000? Well, remember, the regret is the highest value minus each decision of the the highest value minus the egg, actual value. And so we are gonna have 100 minus 100. Why? Because the highest value in the first column was 100. Minus this 100 here will give you zero. So the regret for this D2 is zero. What is the regret for the D3? For the regret for the D3 is gonna be the highest value, which is 100,000. A minus D3, and let's go to D3. I just want it to be following what I'm doing, D3. So this is D3, and if you look at D3, for the conditions there, you have 30,000 or 30. So what do you think is a regret today? The regret there is going to be 100 minus the 30. 100 minus this state. And what would that give you? Well, if you have a mathematical eye, you see that 100 minus 30 is 70. So for the first column, we've been able to calculate each of breadth. Let's go to the second column. That one too, you need to look for the highest value there. The highest value is 30. So we're going to take the 30 and then go back in our table to go and watch the expected value. The expected value for D1 was what? 50. And so the highest value of 30 minus that one will be what? 20. Let's go to the next row. The highest value here. The highest value that we are gonna have here is, um, is 30, as you know. You can see it on the screen. Okay, and the value on the Second row is negative 40. So it's going to be 30 minus minus 40. Let's take note. And that will be 70. And then the last regret. You are going to have 30 again minus the last row. And if you check carefully, the last row. Yeah. What was that? The last row that you're going to have there is warehouse, and that is 10,000. And so you're going to have 30,000 minus 10,000. 30,000 minus 10,000. What would you get? Well, 30,000 minus 10,000, you get 20,000. So you've been able to recreate the regret table and each decision alternative has got a number. Each one of them has a number. So take note of that. Once you've created the, the next thing is very easy. So now, um, Cam, you have a question. Um, Doc, please, yeah. how did we get the 20,000? Because I'm assuming. Okay. I'm assuming we. I'm assuming it's thirty thousand minus thirty thousand. 
Oh, okay, 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 okay. It looks like I'm doing the second lane. I'm doing the second lane. Let's check, let's check. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so the first one, and it's good, the first one, Look at the first one. The first one, the value was uh, 50. I just want to check. Let me just check. The value for the first one was 30,000. Yes, please. So the first one will be zero. Okay, thank you, doctor. The second one, the value, and I'm looking at the second because I was reading everything on the third one. The value was negative 40, so it would be 30 minus minus 40. And then the last one will be 30 minus 10, which is 20. All right, so it's the first one that will be zero. In fact, actually, every column, there must be one zero there because the number will be minus in itself. Okay, so you want to take it. All right, so this is our table. How do you get the minimum of the regrets? Once you've gotten this, create another column here. And then call that column something like minimax regret. Minimax regret. Okay. And what you are going to do is just look at the row and select the highest of the regret. Just select the highest of the regret. So if you look at the first row, the highest regret is what? It's 50. The second row, the highest regret is 70. The third row, the highest regret is 70. So now you have the highest regret. You've got to take the highest regret. Out of that highest regret now that you have, select the lowest of those highest one time. So you, I would have done it in another column. But because there's no space on my right, I'm doing it here. So you create another column called minimax regret. So this minimax regret is the lowest regret out of the columns you set up. And when you look at these ones, the lowest is what? Is 50. And therefore, you can say that the minimum regret value is 50. Which decision has that? It's decision alternative one. And therefore, you can say that under the minimum regret approach, D1 is the recommendable you know, action to take. D1 is recommended. And then you are sorted for that. That is how you approach the minimum support. Any question on that? Any question on the minimum support? Everything that we have done so far, if you check the slides, you see all of these things that we have done so far. All right. Now, let's go to decision-making with a different approach. So we've looked at three approaches now, optimistic, pessimistic, opportunistic. Okay. The opportunistic is where you created a regret table. Then you're able to make a final decision. Life is not, it's not certain. You are not sure whether the economic conditions are gonna be great. So no probabilities were assigned previously, but now we are going to assign probabilities. We're going to assign probabilities to the whole thing. And there are two criteria to make probabilistic decisions. One is known as expected value without perfect information. Yes, you will assign probabilities, but then it is without perfect information. What is expected value without perfect information? The expected value without perfect information is the expected value of what you are looking for. But then whatever that is helping you, whatever probabilities you have, those probabilities that you have are not perfect. That's all you're saying. And sometimes it's known as expected value approach. Expected value approach. So the expected value without perfect information or the expected value approach, EV, is given by this formula. 
Note that probability is always between zero and one. Okay. So the expected value, this is a formula, please write it down. Write this. Expected value for a particular decision is a sum of their individual values, each multiplied by the probability of the state of nature. So, so let's go back to the original. Now we can now understand perfectly what we mean by this. So you have, don't forget that you still have your decision alternative D1, you have your D1, you have your D2, and then you still have your D3. The state of nature is S1 and then S2. The probability for the state of nature uh, S1 happening, okay? the probability of state of nature S1 happening is given by 60%. And all the time, one one is given, there's always one last one that is left. So if the state of nature are four, I will give you the probability of state of nature one, probability of state of nature two, probability of state of nature four. And then I expect you to find the probability of state of nature three. So in the one example that you have here, what is the probability of state of nature two? What is it? Seven. So it's 40. It's 40 percent. So the probability of state of nature two is 40 percent, which is 0.4. So I want you to know that if the state of nature are 13, how many probabilities are you going to have be given? If they are 13, how many probabilities are you going to be given? Yes, Steven. 12. Okay, so that is how you do it. Now, we are told this probability of state of nature two is 0.4, and that of one is 0.6. Now, using that approach, using the expected value approach, calculate for us which decision to go for. Now, this is how you do it. So remember, the expected value of D1, and I'm going to do only D1, then you guys can do the rest. For D1, is going to be, remember, this is value. So you have to go and take the value, not a regret table. Take the value of the, of the expected value approach, the original value. And so if the, the original value for, for D1, if you can remember, is 50 and then 30, do you remember? 50 on the left, 30 on the right. So the expected value is going to be the 50 multiplied by the state of nature for that. And the state of nature, the probability of the state of nature, the multiply by the probability of the state of nature. The probability of state of nature is 0.6. So this is times 0.6, then plus, Go to the next value. So the next value that was there was 30,000 or 30. So you now do 30 times 0.4. That will give you the answer for the expected value of D1. What did you get? What did you get? What did you get? Okay, so if you work out well, you just do 50 times 0.6 plus 30 times 0.4. When you do that very clearly, you get 42. You get 42. Okay. So when you, when you do that well, you're gonna get an answer which is 42. So, this is going to give you 42. The next one is expected value of V2, which is going to be the 100,000 
times 0.6, 100,000 times 0.6, is it 0.6? Yeah, 0.6. Probably the state of nature is 0.6. Then plus the negative 40,000 times 0.4. So solve for that and tell me the value, the expected value for decision alternative two. Search for that. If you do it well, if you do it well, you're going to get an answer, which is 44. You're going to get 44. So the expected value for decision alternative two is 44. What about decision alternative three? Work out that for me. Decision alternative three. Okay. When you look at the first column, which is 0.6. You look at the, what do you call it? The 0.6 multiplied by the highest value is 100. Then 0.4 multiplied by the highest value is 30. Okay. And you get 22. So you are not deciding. You are not calculating for D1, for D2, for D3. No, no. Expected value would prefer the information. You are getting one answer. That's it. Because you're going to use it for something else. So that is it. So expected value with preferred information, you don't use it to decide. But expected value or expected value without preferred information, you use it to decide. And remember, you are using the values. You are not using the regret table. You look at one where you use the regret table and it has a different name. Now let's go to the next one. So, so now we are ready to calculate the expected value of perfect information. That's what we are ready to calculate now expected value of perfect information. Now, what is that? The expected value of perfect information is different from the expected value with and without perfect information. So the expected value of perfect information is the absolute value of the expected value with perfect information, the absolute figure minus expected value Without perfect information. Yeah, yeah. And Miriam, ask your question. Miriam, ask your question. Your hand is up. Sir, uh, please, how did you get a 22? I showed how I got it. I did it twice. I how showed... did you get a 22? Why, you weren't following me. Because zero point six by what did you get? Yes, yes. Look. What did you I get? Yes, it's supposed to be seventy two. What what I was trying to be sure. I want to be sure whether you are really following. Yes, because because okay. I, I I always want to be sure that you are following. Sure. And. The only way I can know that you are following is when you when you do that. So when you go and do 0.60, okay, this alone, this value alone is going to give you 60. This is 0.6 times that. So obviously it wasn't going to be 22. But I wanted to be sure that you guys are truly with me. And, and that is why I wanted to be sure. And then that again goes to show that you are truly following. So when you do that, you are going to get 70, um, 72,000. Well, it depends on what you are doing. Okay, you can get 72. Uh, oops. Okay. You're going to get um, 72, but not. You know, or oh, 72,000, okay, it doesn't matter. Whether you're dealing with the thousands or you're not dealing with the thousands. That is that is the value you get. Okay, so once you've gotten this value, you're not going to calculate the expected value of perfect information. This is how you calculate the expected value. The expected value of perfect information is the expected value with perfect information minus the without perfect information. The with perfect information is 72, you just got it. Without perfect information, it is the 
The one you selected when you were doing the expected value approach, the three approaches. Let me take you back. So when you were doing all of these three approaches, there was one that you selected, which was 44. If you can remember, there was, there was 44 that you selected. That was expected value approach or the expected value without preferred information. Okay. Because you were doing it on the, the decisional lines. And when you do that, you got 44. Now, that is what you're going to replace here, 44. And so you're going to have 72 minus 44. And when you do that, you're going to get a certain value. What value will you get? Okay, you get 28, okay. So you're gonna get 28. What does the 28 mean? And this is where I want you to listen, please. The 28 is the price you are willing to pay to someone to give you perfect information, that's it. The price you wanna be able to pay. So that one, you see, information is valuable. So if somebody is giving you information, you have to pay for it. The 28 shows them, price you are willing to pay for that. So the 28 is not to make a decision, but to indicate the, the, the price you're willing. And of course, the price you're willing to pay is the value of the information you think you're going to have. So that is expected value of perfect information. You see, we looked at several criteria. It's not difficult, but the only thing is that is annoying. So you've got to master the criteria. Now, once you're done with this, you're left with the last thing. The last thing we are going to calculate is the expected opportunity loss. E O L. Expected opportunity loss is a summation of the probability of the state of nature J. Each state of nature J multiplied by the regret. That's it. Multiply by the regret. So so this is why you use a regret table when you are calculating the expected opportunity loss. But when you are calculating the expected value, you use the payoff matrix. You use the payoff matrix. But when you are calculating the expected opportunity loss, you use a regret table. So what he's saying is that take each probability and multiply by the regret. Do you remember the regrets? Let me just remind you. This is where the regrets, what you see on your screen, they were the regrets. And the probability are 0.6 for the first column, 0.4 for the second column. You have to show working for the 0.4. The 0.4 is one minus the 0.6 because probability is 100%. Now, how do you calculate the expected opportunity loss? That one is done at decision lines. So you have to do it for each decision. Use it to decide. Okay, how do you do it? It's a very simple approach. This is how you do it. Let me just wipe out this section here so that I can just do the first one for you. And then you can do the other ones. So remember, like I said, it is for each of these. So EOL, let me use a different uh, EOL for D1 is given by. Remember, it is a probability multiplied by the regret for that very D1. So it's going to be 0 0.6 times the 50 plus 0.4 times the zero. That's how the first one is going to be. Okay. 0 0.6 times the 50 plus the 0.4 times the zero. Whatever answer you get, that is your expected opportunity loss for D1. Now let's do for D2. Expected opportunity loss for D2. Okay. Again, is a probability which is the 0 0.6 times zero plus the next column. So you go to the next column here. That next column is 0 0.4 times 70. And that will give you that one. Okay. Expected opportunity loss for the second one. See, do for the third one. Okay, so for the third one, 
is going to be EOL D3. And then you do the probability, which is 0.6 times the 70. Remember the 70 is the regret times 70 plus the second probability, which is a 0.4 times 20. Okay. And when you are done with each one of them, you'll be able to now know your expected opportunity loss. I want you to tell me which one gave you that. And again, this one, you're going to select the lowest one. So which one gave you the lowest loss? Which one gave you the lowest expected opportunity loss? Who has done it all? The first one gave you what value? The first one, what value did you get? Let me just clear and go to new page. Uh, Miriam, you are the one who okay. Yes, Steven. So the first value is 30. The first is 30. Second? Second is 28. Second is 28. And third? Third is 50. Okay. So based on this, you have to now select which one gives the lowest value. And that is what? 28. So you can see that the lowest loss is 28. So you decide by choosing the office building using this approach. The office building will be because it gave you the lowest loss. Now, I have a question for you. If you look at this answer of 28, do you realize that that same 28 was the value you had when you were calculating for the expected value of perfect information? Do you remember? Expected value of perfect. The expected value EVPI. It was it's also. Just, uh, it's rather expected value with perfect information. No, expected value of perfect information. Remember, the expected value of perfect information equals the expected value with minus the expected value without. Just go and check. The expected value of perfect information is EVPI. Is the expected value weight, small w, PI, minus the expected value without W O P I, the absolute value of it. And this one of them was a value of 72, and the other was 44, and the two gave us 28. Do you remember? Do you remember, Kevin? Yes. All right, so that value matches this one. So that is your clue for you to know whether you are right or wrong. Anytime you want to know whether you are right or wrong, when you cross-validate the two values, it will help you. But what, does, what do they mean? What it simply means is that the, the, your loss, because remember, this is expected opportunity loss. Okay. So your loss that we just calculated, the lowest loss was 28. And then that is the same price you are willing to pay to someone for prepared information. So anytime you are making a decision, you don't want to make a decision that is, you know, where you are paying more than you are going to lose. Okay. You don't want to pay more than you lose. And that is the, that, that's the importance of this exercise. Your expected opportunity loss, that's the first criteria. That's the first rule that you want to learn. Okay. The first rule is that the amount to pay for perfect information is also the expected opportunity loss. Put that down. The amount to pay for perfect information happens to be the expected opportunity loss. So the expected value approach and then the expected opportunity loss approach, these two approaches. Okay. The EV approach and then the EOL approach, they will always lead to the same decision result. So if your decision says that you should select B1 under the EV approach, then you will also have to select D1 under the EOL approach. They all lead to the same conclusion. That's a key point. 
both approaches will also use the probabilities. Both approaches will use probabilities. Both approaches will lead to the same conclusion. However, the expected opportunity lost, that one, the number you select that leads to that choice, that number is the same as the number for the, for the expected value of perfect information. So I'm giving you some thing to go and try your answer. This is a this is an exam question in 2012 and 2013. A BTA publishing company publishes management science textbook that is scheduled for a revision. And the management science textbook has different types, and these are the different types. One is SPB, SSC, you know, and then several criteria are here. This is the data set. And the economic conditions are competitive market conditions are unfavorable conditions, same condition, favorable conditions. So you have all of this. You can see that here, the state of nature are more and the decision alternatives are not three, they are also four. Your job is to answer this question. Determine the best decision under the maximax and the maximum approaches. Determine the best decision under the minimax regret approach. Those ones don't use probabilities. Then here, you can see that because he wants you to know that they use probabilities, he gave you the probabilities, but he didn't give you for one. He says, suppose now the probabilities of the state of nature are S2, S3. He didn't give you S1. He's expecting you to calculate the S1. What would be the best decision under the expected opportunity loss? Do you now see? Expected opportunity, the last one we just calculated, EOL. So using the formula, you should be able to calculate for each alternative. And then finally, find the expected value of perfect information and compare your results with C. Expected value of perfect information, what is that? It is a one weight minus the one without. And you can compare your results because that value will give you will be equal to that value you will get in D here must be equal to the choice variable that you had here. So I want you to take your hand, solve it, and then come and show me your results. <laughs> 